you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you, Professor Berger, for inviting me. And thank you for the audience still waiting for the last talk. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest, at least in this topic. And we have to go on. Yes. The first question is, how do we uh, decide whether this patient is eligible for leisure or competitive sport? Most of us would say, okay, is the patient able to do that? But look at this sportsman, for example. He's not able to walk. Would, he, would we allow him to walk? Of course, he should learn that. So that is the wrong question. Um, it is a better question, what is dangerous for the patient? But if we look on that sportsman, we have to realize that uh, we are not talking about obvious risks, we are talking about hidden risks. And we are talking about hidden medical risk on short term, and we are talking about hidden <coughs> medical risk on long term. So I want to stick to those two topics now. First, let's go into a registry of sudden death in young competitive athletes. That was a collection over 26 years, all deaths that happened in America that, uh, that are athletes below 40 years. And they collected, unfortunately, 1,866 deaths. And if you look at these deaths, uh, um, about one third was of non-cardiac origin. That was, for example, suicide or injury or drugs. Maybe doping is a little bit more there, but not here. And we have a lot of cardiovascular deaths, um, but only, again, two thirds of them we know very exactly what is the reason for this cardiac death. And now we see uh, the hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy and several other things, and we will find indeed the aortic stenosis that causes 17 deaths in this series. Coarctation is not mentioned, just a comment. So we can clearly state, okay, um, sudden cardiac death or aortic stenosis is associated with uh, sudden cardiac death, but we have to be very precise. There's a certain risk for, for sudden cardiac death in unknown aortic stenosis. However, what we do not know is what is the incidence of sudden cardiac death in patients with known aortic stenosis, because all known aortic stenosis, if they reach a certain level, we will treat them. So, I come back to that, what I missed the whole two days, uh, what is an asymptomatic aortic stenosis and a symptomatic aortic stenosis, and what is low, moderate, and severe. And I totally do not agree with some speakers, especially in Gudena, that we have no idea what that is. There are recommendations, we took over them uh, to our German pediatric cardiology guidelines, and we have also some some literature why we did so. First, I go to the asymptomatic aortic stenosis. This term, asymptomatic aortic stenosis, is based on the medical history. So ask the patient whether he has no angina, even not at physical exercise. Whether the patient has no dyspnea at rest and at low exercise. Important, not at high exercise. When you come to my exercise lab, I promise you I'll get you dyspneic. <laughs> and you have to ask for syncope, if they deny to have any dys syncope. And if all these three things are denied, then this is an asymptomatic patient with aortic stenosis, and only them. The next is a slide from the current recommendation, and to be sure, that is not only the gut feeling of three authors, there's a gut feeling of some Americans, for example, and some ESC people. And this is simple calculation. You know these calculations, how you come from that to that. And this is a few other studies that are mainly from congenital aortic stenosis. And it's, it is la how it is most often defined. And that is just to remember this number, that is the 40 millimeter mercury for a mean instantaneous gradient, 
I at least have learned that this should be the same that that, but this here, you define it a little bit more in the cath lab, the 40 millimeter should be the threshold for a severe aortic stenosis. Well, how d what do we do with this? We, this is the background when we treat the patients, and there's no doubt that a symptomatic, severe aortic stenosis should be treated as quick as possible, because they have a substantial risk of sudden cardiac death. However, on the other side, the low aortic stenosis, there's no question that we should not treat them. And for the moderate, there's some discussion that if you get the one or the other sign, you might treat them. But most of, all, of, most of us would agree that moderate aortic stenosis should not be treated. So the main question is, which one of the asymptomatic, severe aortic stenosis should be treated? Let's have a look for the incidence of sudden death in asymptomatic, severe aortic stenosis. Mr. Peter has already told us about these studies and fr uh, at the conclusions. The oldest study, remember, there were no echocardiography at this moment, so the severe aortic stenosis was just the clinical findings from the second heart sound split, how it is split, and how, fa how fast is the murmur, and how well filled is the pulse. That was the tools of this days. L then they, uh, see, they saw a 3 to 5% per year incidence of ca uh, sudden cardiac death. Later on, when they have uh, access to echocardiography, they have much less rate of this uh, incidence. So, to summarize, the incidence of sudden cardiac death in truly asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis is less than 1% per year. That's a good news for those that are octarians, and that is where the data are from, because they have a higher uh, incidence of death at all. But for us, it is uh, not so uh, good news. However, all our recommendations are based on these data. So I want to come to the recommendation that is the Bethesda group in America. These Bethesda recommendations are almost law in America. You have to s say that. So if an do American doctor allows you something that is against the Bethesda conference, and if anything happens, he will be sued for that. So, but they stick to this information and they have a little bit uh, space that nothing happens. So all the severe aortic stenosis patients are not eligible for competitive sport. We are talking about competitive sport, we are not talking about leisure sport in this Bethesda confer conference meeting. Uh, for those with moderate aortic stenosis that are asymptomatic, have no or low left ventricular hypertrophy, have a normal ECG, have a normal exercise test, but they might have arrhythmia, they should only perform low static and low or moderate dynamic exercise for competitive sport. For, for the other that have the same criteria, but if they have no arrhythmia, they are in addition allowed to have moderate static and low dynamic exercise. And only those with mild aortic stenosis, normally CG, asymptomatic, normal exercise capacity, though are the green lights and have no limits for sport eligibility. We try to translate this Bethesda to childhood and try to translate this competitive sport recommendations to recommendations for physical activity, recreational and um, competitive sport uh, to get a general guideline for sport activities in children with congenital heart disease. That was the publication last year. And um, for aortic stenosis, we still are we're very careful at the current moment, because we decided to have the mild aortic stenosis has no restrictions, and the moderate have only in competitive sport, they have restrictions concerning dynamic exercise, cardiorespiratory training, 
and for strength training, we would like to restrict them to moderate intensity only. So they should not uh, do strong and with a he heavy impact uh, strength training, for example, weightlifting. That is a very recent study that I uh, acknowledged only when I was preparing that talk. Um, they investigated uh, the exercise restriction of the balloon valvuloplasty for congenital aortic stenosis. That is the current thing that we are doing all the time. We see a patient, the patient has aortic stenosis, we balloon them, and after ballooning, we have to give the advice whether to restrict exercise capacity or whether not to restrict. And they found that in their group, one, of the con uh, one half of the consultant are very liberal concerning sport, and the other half of the consultant are just restricting everybody. However, this was a retrospective study with 528 patients. The mean follow-up was 14 years. That calculates over 6,000 patient years. However, you have, to, um, you have to exclude all those patients that are still under four because the exercise restriction does not make any sense. And so they analyzed only those 400 with the age over 400. And exercise restriction was given to 183 patients, that's 2,500 patient years. And no exercise restriction was given to 220 patients, that's about the same amount of patient years. What were the gradients, the peak gradients in the ACO in those two groups that are all patients after ballooning the aortic valve? And you see it's fairly similar. Maybe the unrestricted group has a little bit higher um, gradients, but you see those concerning the definition I showed before. We have patients with a low grade residual, uh, the low residual gradient. We have patients with a moderate residual gradient. And we even have some patients with a high residual gradient, even with a peak instantaneous gradient of more than 100. So most of us would consider them to re-balloon them, but they included them into the study and analyzed what uh, happened up to this point. They calculated 17 deaths. And that was the above line is, oh sorry for very s small writing, that is the exercise unrestricted group, they even have a better one, uh, survival, and the exercise restricted group is the lower group. However, this is not significant. So they followed exercise restriction does not have any impact of survival in these patients. However, this is a very, very lousy study, I should say, because they did not control whether the patients were really not exercising or whether they were neglecting the doctor's, uh, the doctor's advice and they do what they want. Therefore, I would be very careful with this data but then you should how many sudden cardiac deaths they found. And they have only a single sudden cardiac death. And that guy was a 28-year-old man who was in the restricted group. And it happened at sleep. So that calculates for an annual rate. Before we had 1% per year, I say. That calculates for a rate of 0.018 percent per year. That's about the risk of um, a car act, uh, of surviving uh, just normal traffic for one year in Germany. Or let's translate it for the Americans. That's the risk of being shot on the road in America. <laughs> so we have a very, very low risk and that is the main the main result of this study, sudden unexpected death, is an extremely rare event after balloon di dilatation for congenital aortic stenosis. And no benefits were observed for exercise restriction. So we should be more liberate. And I think we should come to that conclusion. If you think a patient with aortic stenosis has a substantial risk for sudden death,
send him for balloon dilatation and don't discuss exercise restriction or not with him. Let's come to coarctation. I've already put out several slides because they were already shown, but this was also shown, but nevertheless, I want to recommend on this. That is coarctation and exercise hypertension from our own study four years ago, or let's say 10 years ago. It was the last final publication from that group. And indeed, we see about 28 patients have exercise hypertension. But how do we deal with that? What is dangerous with exercise hypertension? If you ask uh, somebody from sports medicine, he says, no, no problem. If you can rise your blood pressure just with a double leg press, for example, both legs, just press it in some of these uh, machines and you will rise your blood pressure up to 480 to 350. And nobody worries about that, nobody measures that and nothing happens. If you ask somebody from adult cardiology, he will say, oh yes, but there might be a myocardial scar and I don't know how the scar deal with this high blood pressure. So maybe exercise uh, hypertension is dangerous, maybe yes. And if a patient has heart failure also, maybe yes. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we think? Is exercise uh, hypertension dangerous? And uh, with aortic aneurysm, I would certainly say yes. And with cerebrovascular aneurysm, that is 10% in aortic coarctation patients, we certainly say yes, clear yes. Marfan syndrome, no question, yes. Turner syndrome, no question, yes. Bicuspid aortic valve, I don't know, probably, maybe not. Coarctation with normal aortic, ascending aortic size and normal good surgical result, I don't know, maybe yes. So maybe we should avoid excessive blood pressure, but we can avoid that. Just refrain the patient to do strength training on big muscle groups. For example, for the legs, train only one leg, and after 10 minutes, train the other one. That blood pressure is not rising if you have only one leg moving or training. You will only get a high blood pressure if you have big muscle groups, and especially if you add Vasalva maneuver. You can manage this, and you can allow them for train, but you have to advise them how to train. So the specific recommendation for this group in this uh, recommendation headed by Tucken was that with bicuspid aortic valve isolated, um, the dynamic exercise can be done without any restrictions and the, uh, the training, uh, the strength training, you should avoid very high uh, strength intensities. For coarctations, we go a little bit further because we have a little bit more data for um, dynamic exercise, no restriction, and for strength training, um, they should be limited to the low and moderate um, intensity, and you should perform an exercise test to rule out an abnormal blood pressure response because then you have really give the, the, pa the patient a few more advices. Next question, we are only talking about bad things of exercise. I should mention, are there positive effects for patients with left outflow tract obstruction? First, I want to make a little circle around the whole two days and want to summarize common findings in all these defects that we discussed the last two days about this left ventricular obstructions. Parashat mitral valve, aortic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve, and coarctations are associated with each other in not a rare instance. I want to remind that there, starting with the first talks, there might be a common genetic background. All these diseases are associated with assorti uh, ascending aortic aneurysm, with cerebrovascular aneurysm, with histologic aortic wall abnormalities that are called cystic medionecrosis. 
with an increased stiffness of the aorta, with an increased pulse wave velocity, we call it preterm arteriosclerosis. We have baroreceptor dysfunction, we have peripheral artery dysfunction, and last but not least mentioned in the last talks, that there's an increased risk for future atherosclerotic disease, that is uh, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and peripheral artery disease. So, I might conclude. First, initially, I wrote a letter to an editor for another study that we should leave the term of coarctation. We should describe it as coarctation syndrome because it is not only the coarctation that is wrong with the patient. But now I would even go st one step further. Let's talk about obstructive left heart syndrome because this syndrome includes a systemic artery disease. And now I talk a little bit about training studies just to get an impression what we can do, what is good and what is bad. First, physical training and blood pressure. This, we have heard about this most uh, in the coarctation it is the, bi the big issue. Low and moderate intensity endurance training reduces systolic mean and diastolic pressure. Isometric exercise reduces also systolic diastolic blood pressure. Resistance training reduces systolic diastolic uh, and mean blood pressure. Another study. Even resistance training reduces uh, blood pressure in women, but increases aortic stiffness in men. Another study showed that resistance training, strength training, increases systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So we should be a little bit careful about strength training. And strength trained athletes that are really highly strength trained have an increased systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So think about it. Next topic, physical, physical training and arterial stiffness, what we called Arthrosc uh, not arthro arteriosclerosis. And urine training reduces arterial stiffness, two studies. Low intensity single leg exercise reduces regional arterial stiffness. That was a very nice study that just trained in the patient one leg. And after six weeks, they compared the pulse wave velocity of that leg with the pulse wave velocity of the other one. And they found a difference. Physical activity retards the age-dependent loss of arterial distensibility. When we grow older, the, uh, the aorta will become stiff. There's no question about this, but this can be retarded by physical activity. Moderate and vigorous uh, physical activity improves cent central arterial stiffness, and again, strength training has increases arterial stiffness, and strength training increases carotid arterial stiffening. Several, many studies that outline that endurance training might be good and strength training might cause something on, the t on the aortic stiffness. Last but not least, the endothelial function and all the studies, uh, not depending on which kind of training, regular moderate exercise training, anaerobic and uh, uh, aerobic and anaerobic exercise training, physical uh, uh, activity at all, all improves endothelial function and also aerobic and resistance combined training uh, improves endothelial function. And last but not least, all these things that we know from coronary artery disease prevention, the epidemiological, uh, epidemiology, epidemiology tells us that a sedentary lifestyle doubles the risk of premature death from cardiovascular disease and regular physical activity and taking up light and moderate physical activity, this improves the risk for cardiovascular disease. And even a randomized study for secondary prevention in coronary artery disease clearly shows that a 12-month program of regular physical exercise in selected patients with stable coronary artery disease uh, resulted in a superior event-free survival. It improves survival if you had already a cardiovascular event.
So, let's summarize. If there are substantial risk for exercise, your therapy is not exercise restriction. Send the patients for intervention or surgery. However, if there's no substantial risk for exercise, you should just do this, the opposite. Promote an active lifestyle and aerobic endurance exercise in order to prevent further cardiovascular events. Thank you.